welcome to the Get Offset Podcast. My name is Andrew. And my name is Emily, and we're here this week for our 100th episode with Scott from the YouTube channel and blooper fame, Knobs. Hi. That was a weird way to say that. That was a weird way to say that, but... I didn't I know this I was number 100. You didn't tell me. Oh, it's just a coincidence, but it is episode number 100. What a treat. Yeah. We've been doing this for almost two years, exactly. Yeah, this is uh, the hundred and what first week we've done this because we only skipped one week. We only skipped one week, yeah. And that was for Blackout Tuesday. So, uh, do you have a favorite don't... episode? Oh, I man. think <laughs> I think I my favorite is still the one with Louise from Dwarfcraft Devices or Mike Adams. Or um, I really enjoy talking to uh, Sadie Dupuy from Sad Thirteen and Speedy Ortiz. Nice. Oh, I should also say the Charlie Bliss episode I liked a lot because I was a big I'm a big fan of their music. I have a lot of favorite episodes and a lot of favorite memories, and I'm not sure where to even begin. Matt Hoops. Matt Hoops was definitely a highlight, um, and it's been uh, phenomenal to get to have follow up conversations with him after the episode the last couple of years. We get to know each other a little bit. Um, yeah. It's been. Uh, let's see here. The Mike Adams episode was also a huge highlight for me. Um, the Louise episode, I think, for a personal growth perspective, by far has to be my favorite episode, though, because we, we talked about um, a lot of things. And I remember very clearly the moment she had to stop me and say, Andrew, that's not how this works, and kind of laid into me for a minute. Not like in a rude way, but like in a, you, I need you to understand this. And I remember just having the oh, like that kind of click moment. I'm like, I am completely wrong here. This makes so much sense now. Why mm -hmm. didn't, thank you for explaining it to me. And just having that moment of like, I'm being willing to say that I'm wrong and just take that in stride. And I think that was a really great moment for me specifically. And I also think um, for our listeners, that was a really great moment to, to see an example of conversation in action creating positive results so yeah it's really yeah. hard to just be wrong but it, I was, it's like a skill mm -hmm. you know it's a learned skill to just realize that you were you were the problem yeah, yeah or even that being wrong isn't a person like someone saying that you're wrong isn't a personal attack is that 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 you have to learn that over time and you have yeah. to train your brain to not take things personally and that's something that uh, I've learned that training your brain is really something that, that happens. Like people always say like, Oh, you're in control with how you respond to things. And that's never really felt true for me in a lot of ways. Um, but they don't mention people who say they don't mention that there's a lot of work involved in changing how you respond to things like things that go wrong. Um, someone second guessing you, someone calling you out for being wrong. And that, you know, personal growth is not something that happens overnight and that you do have to put the work in. Totally. Well, yeah. I'm thankful to uh, Louise and everyone else who's pinned me down over the last uh, hundred episodes. And <laughs> I'm it... coming for you today, Andrew. <laughs> Andrew likes, Andrew, I think doesn't like it as much, but he used to really like playing devil's advocate. Saying that I like it, I think, is an unfair characterization, but saying that I think it's an important part of the conversation <laughs> mm. uh, and providing the, the contrast, I think, is more fair. Well, I think that you can say some people would say this position without saying I'm playing devil's advocate. Yeah, but then I've got to say that I've got to qualify every statement. It's just easier to qualify like a chunk of the episode. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's like, all right, guys, I'm going to put on my mask here. And then at the end of the episode, I'm going to take it off. That feels a little bit easier for me to manage sure that's not what i i think that would be a difficult thing to get into this early in the morning <laughs> well um let's uh let's start with what's new uh emily what's new with you oh well, i got some new guitars andrew what do say i did i you got know. two I got two more guitars, um, probably the last two I'm going to get from the uh, Squire Paranormal series. I got the uh, 
the Cabernita Telecaster thin line with the quote unquote jazz master style pickups. They're really P90s, but who cares? They sound good. Uh, and I'm in love with that guitar. Uh, really in love with it. It's just uh, very buttery and fun to play. And kind of like, I didn't expect to like that guitar at all. I kind of thought, it, oh, you know, it's boring, blah, 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 blah. But it's it's just such a nice guitar. Um, I also got the the Cyclone from the Paranormal series, and that that's it's also a very very good guitar. I don't like it as much, um, but I just swapped the pickups in it yesterday, so I like it a lot more than I did when I first got it. Gotta love the Fender stuff. I do love the Fender stuff, and I put the Josephina Handwound Fat sixty pickups in there. Nice. So uh, the the pickups officially. Um, were more expensive than the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Which is something that's funny to do. Like, tell me you can't put lipstick on a pig. <laughs> tell me. You know, it's beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and uh, prices are just a number. Yeah. That's just the no. value that someone puts on a thing. Fender's been having a record year, turns out. I they're take a little credit. <laughs> <laughs> but the, they announced uh, a couple days ago what, that they're projected to have the highest selling year of all time for their company. Yeah. That's, I mean, that like com combining the, the COVID with just releasing really good products and doing good marketing. Like, I feel like that really came together for them because they do have such great entry level stuff um, in the Squire line right now. And, yeah. um, and now people are picking up their, they're old hobbies that they kind of let lapse or new hobbies and uh, Fender, like all the guitar builders. Someone said, someone from Taylor said that the baby Taylors are back ordered through 2022. I love uh, those. Back order, like behind production. I forget exactly how it was phrased, but yeah, uh, they're definitely. So I think he said sold out through 2022, which. Which is mind blowing. Uh, that's yes. just wild. Uh, yeah. I think the number is like 170,000 of them or something like that was the number that got dropped. I think that's how many that they can make a year is what he said. That's what it was. Yeah. 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 So, so that's, they're that far behind. That's like almost, let's just round up to half a million. That behind. just feels unreal. That's like an out of body experience. Just thinking about that. Yeah. Oh, that's absolutely. a lot of good. That's a lot of guitars. Yeah, when we start getting into the handful of times we start getting like into the numbers on the show, um, either in the episode or for research, my my brain kind of goes into the, oh my god, this is, this is wild. This is yeah, <laughs> what? Because Even... numbers don't numbers don't always represent like I, I like I like numbers because like you you can you can manipulate them sure. But um, like with when we did the episode about everyone getting mad about ayahuasca because there were a couple flippers and we were like, well, actually, only about four percent of people who spot these seem to have immediately flipped them on Reverb and uh, Reverb and eBay. Sure. Stuff like that. But and then you For get sure. the big numbers like, oh yeah, but they're sold out. But how like how far behind in production are they? Like three hundred and forty thousand. Like oh oh, <laughs> big whoop. That's yeah, a, yeah. Wow. Talk That's about a, a lot sound of like hotcakes. Wow. Oh. So Taylor's doing great. Fender's doing great. Fender also just announced the uh, the Billie Eilish uke, the concert That's ukulele. Cool. Yeah, she deserves it. I think it's pretty cool. I think uh, uh, all of the uh, middle aged straight white men that are complaining about it are just upset. And... Why? It doesn't affect them. Like this is the thing I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> this literally doesn't affect you at all. Just be like, oh, okay, and then no, like it, it does. It. <laughs> it affects their ego. <laughs> How can uh, can the white men on the podcast this week please explain? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna spit all okay here for a second. Ukulele. Oh, I I think it's great. I just just reading through some of the comments I've seen in forums the last couple of days, it just very much seems like a gatekeeping statement of I'm a better an assertion that I'm a better musician than Billie Eilish is. Therefore she doesn't deserve it because I don't deserve one. And the fact that she's getting one means that I'm really terrible. It's kind of like the implied psychological read there. Yeah. You know, she won like five Grammys. What? <laughs> right. <laughs> Wait till usually when you get your sixth Grammy is when you get a custom ukulele. 
is the thing. Oh, see, I thought it was five, and I thought that six was the jacket. Oh yeah, that's the uh, that's one of the rules in the the book misogyny. <laughs> you get the you get the smoking jacket, or was that Saturday Night Live? Oh, that's on page sixty nine. Nice. I, I, so, I don't know on, what it on. is, but I feel like there's always like um a pendulum swing when any person experiences too much success, yeah. where it's like like some <laughs> some personality type <laughs> just feels compelled to like balance out the pendulum. And, you know, obviously you don't have to do that, but it just seems like it happens no matter what. It's like Even, like, with, like, people who used to be fans. Like, I remember when the first time I saw Mumford & Sons was Bonnaroo at um, this or that tent. I don't remember which of them, but it wasn't which stage, and it wasn't what stage, and it wasn't the other tent. So it was either this or that tent. And um, that was a stupid joke. I'm sorry, but that is literally how Bonnaroo names their stages. Um <laughs> And uh, yeah, it was it was really well attended. And I remember this one guy I knew in particular just raving about how much he loved Mumford and Sons. And now, like, then like three years later, like, just really dislikes them and thinks they're boring. I'm like, how? What changed? The music is the same, my guy. Well, because other people like them as well now, and that's problematic. Yes, I, I want to be before special they were cool because they weren't cool yet. <laughs> want to be special i kind of have this so theory special. that like for many people celebrities become an extension of their ego because they only experience them like when they're in the comfort of their aloneness <laughs> so i think like celebrities often, yeah like they become less human and more like um parts of someone else's identity and then when that changes it's upsetting oh I like that, but I'm also frightened. That's actually that. really profound, and I really, really like that. But then, like, how many friends have I made um, because we shared an interest in? Well, actually, that's mostly just the hold steady, and I don't know if the hold steady were ever in super duper danger of becoming like Mumford and Sons famous. But I wish that they would because they deserve it. Yeah. So I mean, what does that clear, say about a reasonable <laughs> thing? But I think it's part of at least what happens. What does that say about a right. person if their uh, their celebrity that they're attached to on that psychological level is Dave Grohl? What's wrong with Dave Grohl? Nothing. I, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just I want to know what Scott thinks about that. Oh man, I know very little about Dave Grohl actually. Um, I watched the Sound City documentary that he made. That was um, a fun one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know very little. I mean, I know he was the drummer in Nirvana and then the Foo Fighters and stuff, but none of that music really i never really did a deep dive into any of it all right fair enough mm -hmm. fair enough mm -hmm. so scott what's new with you <laughs> <laughs> um pretty i mean i've been feeling i've been feeling like a squirrel um of late i just moved this past month and um it's become really an ordeal like moving is such a pedestrian thing to do and everyone does it and i think like even talking about it feels kind of stupid, but it's really taken over my world. Um, and I, I'm still living in disarray here, but that's coming together and it's an upgrade. Um, did my first live stream a couple nights ago, which is fun. All right. The blooper, the the new, I need to go back and watch that. I just have been so swamped. It was pretty fun. We most critical thing, which was sharing the new firmware with the users um it's funny to like what that seems easy right um but we we had trouble with that so there was the comments for the first like 20 minutes are just like where's the firmware and we're making jokes um so that part was weird but it was fun we brought in a lot of people that were really helpful like the beta testing team you know things that people don't consider a lot but are big parts of these projects mm -hmm. um beta testing is no joke it's a it's a pain in the ass to be honest like it's it's hard it's work i don't i don't think um yeah you know actually one of our, our beta testers paul who's also like the midi specialist for chase bliss um he said this thing one time i'll never forget about how kind of thankless it is because if, if you don't find any problems um you feel like you're not doing a good enough job as a beta tester and then if you do find problems nobody likes you you know, you, you kind of feel like an asshole. <laughs> yeah, you're the bearer of bad news. And we had lots of problems with bloopers. So, you know, is I'm sure it's a very conflicting 
thing to be a beta yeah. tester. And that's got to have like some sort of like Pavlovian response built in. Be like, hey guys, I found a problem. No, you can't find problem. Like, <laughs> yeah, thanks, Paul. You like, yeah. you, you you cringe and jump back, and now you're extra hesitant to announce yeah. the next problem you find and <laughs> rinse and repeat until they you're weren't hesitant, Andrew. Not one bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, and they shouldn't be because that's literally their job. But right. like, I think about video game testers and like their thing is sometimes they just have to like do like run up against a wall 15 times slight, in slightly different ways to make sure they don't like there's not a bug that allows them to like break through that wall. And like that sounds so monotonous. It is monotonous. And um, oh. one thing we do talk about on that stream is we had this one bug with blooper where, you know, ultimately it's a digital pedal. So it's, it's ones and zeros. And um, there was this thing that would happen where there would be a, a, a one sample would progress um, ahead of the other. So there's like a record head and a play head. And if one, if those di became disconnected by one sample, the most horrible sound you could imagine, just like wall of digital modem noise would happen. Um, that's 10 times louder. It's basically like um, limited. So it's as loud as, as possible would happen. Oh, and it was happening all throughout development. And so like testing blooper was actually really, really horrifying. Like, <laughs> the kind of noise where like you, your, your, um, your nervous system reacts to it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and that would happen without warning the whole time, but not only would it happen. So if it happened to me or someone else, I'd be like, Oh no, we have to like, make that better and then i would not touch the pedal for a while but the beta team would have to figure out why and and repeat it again and again mm -hmm. is that so key is re repeatability is so key for any error like your fear is that something goes wrong and you can't replicate it because then like how do you figure out what went wrong yeah exactly it has to be 100 percent repeatable or there's nothing we can do about it yeah. right but that sounds like a terrifying like auditory jack-in-the-box we're just out of the blue, like full dial-up noises just attacking your senses. Some people pay for that, you know. <laughs> well, I, I can I can give them the firmware that would do it for Blooper if they want. <laughs> Look, I, I don't kink shame here. No, absolutely not. I mean, I owned a mini a, a TKOG mini glitch for a while, and I the Cal and uh, Sadisk man is which with its weird like anti skip uh sony disc man capabilities like those like that's one of my favorite pedals but like full mode of noises i feel like that would just like send me back to a bad place for my childhood i feel like i'd have to wear diapers if i was beta testing that just just in case because you were a baby when the internet started no more more like i would <laughs> I, I would <laughs> myself if it just hit me at like oh. 120 decibels it's really scary. Have you? Let me hit timeline footnote. Andrew sh himself. <laughs> You've probably used um, feedback loopers before, right? Sure. I haven't actually. They, um, I mean, Death by Audio just put one out. There, there's some options, and and what they do is, you know, like a how a delay uses a feedback loop to create repeats. Um, you can apply that to any effect, but there's always like a critical. Uh, turnover point where if you turn the feedback up too high it will self oscillate right mm -hmm. which is you know kind of another uh horrifying noise <laughs> if and you're not intending for it to happen you're not and and the thing is with with feedback loopers often the um the moment that is most interesting is like right beside the moment where it becomes truly horrifying um so yeah that's another way to experience sheer terror through a guitar pedal if you want is feedback loopers Nice. Well, uh, Dogman Devices has a feedback looper called the Ouroboros, and he has a sale, so I'm kind of thinking about getting one of those. That could be fun. They're fun, and and you never know what you get, right? Because you're you, you're the I, the way I think of them is hacking another pedal. Because on their own, they don't really do anything, um, mm -hmm. but they allow you to they what they do is just feed the output of any pedal back into its input again and again and again. So depending on what that is, cool things can happen and. Uh, Actually, I, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I do have two pedals that have that. I have the Multicano by Bookworm FX and the um, Meat Mod, I think, has that. But I've never just played with a feedback looper on its own. But um, Actually, shoot, I'm such a liar. I have the um, the Klein bottle. In fact, I have the Knobs version of the Klein bottle. Oh, that'll That's do like, it. Yeah. Wow, what am I thinking of? Why, 
Why am I like this? I haven't had a dedicated one, but I've, uh, I remember accidentally discovering that I was able to do it by botching my reamp setup to accidentally feed back into itself again. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I was, I, accident, I, you know? I was trying to reamp uh, dry signal through my pedal board and I was experimenting with that. And it's like, wait, when I turn up the gain over like a certain level, suddenly the signal starts to break itself and it's amazing. What's going on? Yeah. Um, and, it can be uh, wonderful. Oh yeah. I, I've had some really fun late night zone out of my mind kind of experiences doing that. But to take a quick step back, you were talking about moving and just want you to know that I sympathize with that. My dad was military. We moved uh, more than your average bear uh, mm. growing up. And I'm, I think this is the first year I haven't moved in the last decade. Oh man. Um, Cause into my adult life through college and whatnot, it was just at least once a year, different apartment, different, different room in someone's house and back and forth all over the place. Totally. I'm just definitely at like grown up level belongings now. I think that's really the difference because yeah, pretty similar. Like moving's definitely a an annual or biannual tradition, but I'm a big boy now. It's hard. <laughs> yeah, oh. I, I I don't like moving and I don't plan on doing it for a while. I just we we bought a townhouse a few years ago, so I'm hoping that I don't have to. Um but um Andrew, what's new with you? We haven't gotten to you and we're twenty two minutes in, so we better I know. Um well, I, I think the, the one thing that's newest with me is uh, a project that I'm staring at right now is I got a couple of sliver jacks from Sinusoid yesterday, and I'm going to attempt to DIY solder them to finally get the PN2 you sold me on my board. Finally. I know. So, because I, I built the board planning to replace an expression pedal with the PN2 at some point. So underneath all of the clean wiring, I still have the, I ran the nine volt power um, lead to that spot and it's just not plugged in anything right now. It's just hiding under the expression pedal waiting for the day that I can do this, but I only had two SP 400 jacks and I need a total of four to wire it up in stereo out of the end of my avalanche run. Right. But then I realized that SP 400 jacks on the side of the PN2 have to go in like this really awkward, like right angle of each other kind of scenario because they don't fit side by side. Right. Which is kind of the point of SB400 square jacks. Um, so I was like, well... Those I... work better on top-mounted things than side-mounted. Sure. And so I was looking at it going, well, I could... I don't know. I could just do get a couple more SB400s and just that way every single jack on the board matches. That's a lie. I've got two pancakes. So it would be mostly SB400s, but I decided to go for the slivers, make it a little bit cleaner just for that one connection and to give me a little bit of a, a soldering challenge. But I'm I've never at... cussed more in my life and regretted trying to ever solder anything than when I was trying to get those slivers. And that's what I've been I told. Like I, I don't I am actually shocked they still sell them because I know that back two years ago when I was trying to do them, they were like, uh, yeah, people tend to just like us to make because it's a great product. I think people just prefer to have them make it because you need a vice. You need an extremely hot soldering iron, and if you don't get it right, you're going to get real mad. Yeah, so Albie was the one that uh, – he actually delivered to my front door because he also had to return my Dunlop Mini from the Fox Cairo Squatch pedal board um, collaboration that we did a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And he had borrowed my my pedal to do a photo shoot with a pedal topper. And uh, so he was returning that, and he brought these back, and I was like, all right, so any advice? And he's like – Call James if you have any problems. <laughs> and, yeah, don't uh, maybe, call. Yeah, maybe James, we'll James live is the stream. one who does them all, right? Oh well, yeah. I remember it was Anthony who uh, actually had James um, take a video showing how they do them, and then I was like, "This is still." Yeah, he. Still <laughs> I think my soldering iron wasn't getting hot enough, so now I have a better soldering iron and a bunch of leftover sliver parts. Maybe I'll give it another go, but. It's so I was critical. warned to do it sober. Yeah. I was warned to uh, not be stressed out before I started. You should always solder sober. Are you? Yeah. Are you? Yeah, what is wrong you? What's wrong with you? I'll Never. Go a long way. I'm not Don't saying that that's solder. something that I do. And I look. I haven't had a drink in four weeks. Well, no, I'm true. I'm on doctor ordered sobriety right now. Uh, not um, for reasons people might think. It's for a medication. Just yeah. No. I <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with sobriety in any way. And if if you need help getting sober. 
Uh, there's lots of great resources, and I would be happy to help. Health has to come first. I'm prioritizing my health, and I think that's a very positive thing. Yeah. Um, but no, it's not why that was brought. It was just the, he was running through. The, he was basically warning me this is this is going to be an interesting experience. But once you get the hang of it, apparently it gets a lot easier. Well, that's like anything. Sure. And I do so, think not enough people like well, like anything when you start, you get the cheapest thing possible. But I would I would suggest you always buy the one hundred dollar soldering iron to start with the adjustable temperature because otherwise you'll just hate soldering and you won't understand yeah. why you hate it so much. I've I got... will say my first soldering workstation was like the kind of beginner kit and I was very glad I had it. And then my next soldering, like I got a little portable one um, because this uh, synth shop in Seattle would do like this weekly solder like or biweekly soldering night. So I wanted something portable to take there. And it was it actually ended up being a better soldering iron. But still, I have my new Weller. Got that the other year and I've never looked back. Though I have ruined a couple of the tips because I'm dumb. I am not going to lie. I picked my soldering iron station uh, for one reason. It's orange. And it, it's orange. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, all I know the, is any soldering project I did um, before I had like a, you know, one where you could set the temperature uh, went poorly in some way, shape or form. And uh, I just thought it was bad soldering or soldering was super hard. And then as soon as I got like a proper iron, things just made so much more sense and the things yeah. worked when I was done. Yeah, yeah. It took me a real while to realize that like, this is not working, not because I'm bad at soldering, but because my soldering tip is dead somehow. Yeah. And the idea of it being hotter as a beginner sounds like, oh, like that's, it's easier to make mistakes, but it's really the opposite. It makes yeah. things fast and you don't like linger on each joint too long. <laughs> Yeah, my friend um, Leon from Pelican Noise Works, he was the one who told me, like, a lot of heat for a small amount of time is better than less heat for a longer amount of time for things like icy chips and pots, mm -hmm. things that can get fried, that you fry them because you're working at too low of a temperature. Totally. Yeah, so you're lingering, and that's bad. Lingering is bad. Lingering is bad. Anything else new with you, Andrew? Um, That's... That's honestly been the the big one. I know I'm missing something. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I've just been doing some general housekeeping and uh, preparing for my next Fox Cairo product launch, but not ready to launch quite yet. Probably in the next week or two. I'll nice. we'll talk more about it after I uh, announce it publicly. Cool. Well, uh, let's get into sponsors, Andrew. Which sponsor do you want to talk about? <laughs> you know which one I want to take right now. I know exactly which one. Go for it. This week's it. episode is brought to you by Earthquaker Devices. Hey. As uh, listeners of the show know by now, that's uh, always been my favorite brand. And yeah, I'm I'm very excited to have them as a sponsor this week. Um, What's so, your favorite one? Uh, Got to um, choose. Favorite one is... For personal reasons, is my Avalanche Run V1 that's got mm -hmm. a uh, um, some personalized doodling inside for me. Oh uh, yeah, uh, penis finger monster. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's the the dick titty titty monster is I think oh, right. exactly how it was phrased when I asked for the explanation for what it was. Um, it paints nice. a picture. I can see it. it. Does. I, there's a picture somewhere on. On the if you scroll far enough through the Get Offset Instagram, there's a picture of the the artwork for that. Uh, for personal reasons, I actually love it. It's personalized. It's got my name in it. Uh, for space out reasons, gotta say, my data corruptor is just one of the coolest things I've ever had in my collection, and I love playing it on bass. I'll just sit down and just mess with it for an hour, and and feels like five minutes. It's just incredible. Nice. So. Those are my two personal favorites. However, something that you should really seriously consider getting that's uh, the newest iteration of the Afterneath is the yeah. V3. Yeah. Can I can I talk a little bit about, about the Afterneath? Because I do have a story from this week about the Afterneath. Tell me your story. I want to hear it. So my, my singer for my band, Sunday Crush, uh, she was uh, doing a, a pickup from the Seattle Gear Swap. And then the guy who uh, she got the thing like it was like a piano or something a keyboard 
Uh, he also gave her like the big boy pedal train pedal board, and she has two pedals. She has a fuzz pedal, and then she uh, has been borrowing for like a year now um, one of my old Blood Noise Endeavors pedals. And I, of course, bestowed upon her a bunch of stuff to try out. And one of them was the Afterneath. And she was doing with our uh, bassist, Isaac, this uh, stream where she goes through the pedals, building her first pedal board, like kind of on a live stream type deal. And uh, I was watching and she asked me, she's like, what's the Afterneath? And I was just like, "Uh, it's spooky. (laughs) It's a spooky pedal. And uh, I don't. I think that's the best way to describe it. It is like, it really is an otherworldly type of reverb. And the V3 has a feature that people have been asking a lot for. Um, Something to control the drag. So now there's like this little mode control on the drag that kind of changes the individual delay lines. So there's... um, unquantized unquantized with slew unquantized bolt octave chromatic scale major scale minor scale pentatonic octaves and fifths and octaves and that controls the way the dra- uh, the drag control functions especially when you're using um like an expression pedal so that's like this like apparently some people have been asking for this for forever and they finally did it and i'm just like it's really neat i'm, I'm a big fan So what I just heard is when I told my physics teacher in high school that I'd never use quantum physics in real life, now I'm using it as a hobby. I think that's my takeaway. Uh, Sure. Let's just – I'm just going to move on. Yeah, man. Just like the sound of like quantum physics in a reverb pedal, bro. But it's a really cool spooky pedal. (laughs) Reverb's going to listen to this. Right. Earthquaker's going to listen to this going like, man, why did we sponsor these guys? (laughs) This is dumb. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, they might. Sorry, Anna and team. Sorry. <laughs> so seriously, go 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 check out. Uh, go get one today. There's really yeah. no excuse. We're all I have stuck a demo. inside. It's orange I outside. De- I have a demo up. I'll put it in the show notes, and I'll put a link where you can buy this on Reverb.com. If you buy it on Reverb.com, you do help us out if you buy it via our affiliate link. So things to consider. Speaking of things to consider, our other sponsor this week is DistroKid. Have you made some super spooky music with your afterneath and you want to uh, put it out there for the world to hear? Spooky. DistroKid is spooky. Uh, <laughs> Do we have a theremin Dist- button? I feel like we've got to no. have a theremin. Oh, man. No. Um, we don't. But uh, it's only 19, uh, about 19.99 a year to have a DistroKid account. You get your music on Spotify, Tidal. You get that Spotify verified check mark automatically. It's super easy to upload stuff. Check out my video uh, showing, explaining how to upload things to um, DistroKid. Uh, check the link in this uh, podcast description, show notes, whatever. Uh, there's a link there. It'll save you 7% on your first year of DistroKid. 7%. And, Heck yeah. I mean, my free like discounts are discounts you know that's a nice round number i like seven percent it's yeah that's seven's actually my favorite number seven is just like a holy christian number so yes i'm I've, obligated I've to that. like it as such it's a prime number i like prime numbers optimus sure fine enough with the dad jokes good god <laughs> that <sighs> transformers okay, jokes we're sorry. are always good we're sorry for comic. Well, yeah, well, I'm sure they'd appreciate it. Whatever. <clears throat> That's fine. We've got That's two fun. disappointed sponsors with my jokes. Yes. Oh yeah, we're never gonna get we're never gonna get sponsors after, <laughs> after this stuff. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, let's move along to talk about knobs. all the things. Talk about we'll talk about pedal demos. Some we have a uh, Scott from Knobs. Uh, I think it's fair to say Scott that Knobs is one of the biggest. Uh, demo channels on on the youtubes subscribers wise i think Mm -hmm. it's one of my it's one of my favorites yeah i've been watching demos for years i've uh uh, i actually your demo for the avalanche run was one of the reasons why i jumped for it in the first place which is how i ended up with a personalized avalanche run Ooh, it feels good yeah no you've you've caused me to make some uh financial decisions over the years (laughs) <laughs> and I know I'm not the only one. Yeah. yeah. The Avalanche no, run is a big one. 
Yeah, so um, I think that uh, this week, well, it'll be last week now, but on Labor Day in America and around the world, um, you were part of a big, a big uh, deluge of, of, of demos for um, the Juliana, the new the new pedal from from Walrus Walrus, which looks like a really cool pedal. Um, but there were forty demos, and you did make a statement on, on Instagram about it. I did, and uh, so um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the gist was kind of like these big demo dumps, kind of. Um, they aren't that they aren't ideal and that you feel like they kind of lessen the work that, that um, demo artists do. So is it something um, that you, you'd be interested in kind of expanding on talking about a little bit more, things like that? Sure. I think you, you put it more politely than I did. I've got the quote right here. I, I could read it if you guys like, you may as well. Let's set the stage here. All right. I'm going to read the entire, the, 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 the entire, uh, the whole damn thing. Here. Yep. Uh, NDD, so New Demo Day, an actual honest-to-goodness demo. It's been a while, and it might be another while before the next. The original Julia video was kind of a special one, so it just felt right, comma, damn it, period. <laughs> that being said, boy, do I you ever just... Dis- <laughs> Sorry. So- You're extremely good that- at reading quotes. <laughs> it. I felt like that was fair emphasis. Um, that being said, boy, do I ever dislike these massive coordinated video dumps. I had no idea about the scale of this one, and I'm honestly shocked. I think it devalues the work of individuals and makes us all seem like part of a big marketing machine. I'm going to be asking more questions going forward because I don't feel good being a part of it. There, period, I said it, period, all caps. Enter. Anyway, it's a great pedal, and I don't fault Walrus for wanting to spread the word. I just think this approach is unsustainable and will create a lot of distrust in the long run. All caps. Anyway, enjoy the video link in bio. Period. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't like. I several days later, I don't know that I would have said it the same way, but um, it got some conversation started. Um, yeah, a lot of. <laughs> there's been a lot of conversations about it. I've seen some other YouTube videos about it, um, albeit the one that I saw was uh, in <laughs> laughably bad. Uh, Wait, but who, who, what video? People have done videos about that that statement, uh, or that? just about payola. <laughs> and oh, that was and... stupid. I'm not. Yeah. We're not going to give any more attention to that. <laughs> that was bad. It's not what payola is. I know. I was like, how stupid do you think musicians are? Um, yeah, very. But I mean, internet beef tastes good, and it that's kind of the way it came <laughs> off. And yeah, yeah. So, um, you said that you might not say it the same way, um. How do you think you would you would say it? Well, I and think also like, I, and my other question is, what prompted you to make um, an Instagram statement like that? Uh, probably a bit of naivety to like the scale of the platform. Honestly, like, um, I just it, it felt like a thing that was personally important to say, but um, I wouldn't say it the same way because of what Andrew just said. Like, it just came across across as like internet beef and. Um, and, and provocative, which was not my intention. So, um, yeah, like Walrus Audio were understandably upset and felt kind of betrayed. And, like, that was a predictable outcome. <laughs> I wasn't thinking about that at the time. And, um, yeah, these, these like, big old video dump things do um, do bother me. And so, like, that's obviously a state. I do stand behind the the point of it. Just wasn't very uh, wasn't very smooth on my part, <laughs> saying mm-hmm. it the way I did. Um, but did I you mean, did you know? But were you aware that that's how they always do the demo releases? I don't know if they've always done like forty plus, but I feel like there are always at least a dozen channels, and just kind of out of nowhere, Walrus releases a new pedal. Yes, and that's a good. Yeah, it's a good point to distinguish because, um, y- yeah, and that's on me. And, you know, 12 videos I don't really object to. I don't I don't object to a whole bunch of things dropping at one time. Um, I was expecting it to a certain extent, but I it was it was really it all happened very fast. I just went to go publish my video and, uh, and just to make sure that it was like actually out and I didn't get the time wrong. <laughs> I typed mm-hmm. Walrus Juli- Juliana into YouTube and I was just scrolling and scrolling and i was just like oh no 
oh no yeah. <laughs> that, that was it it was like you know if it on the surface or it might seem like um so much more calculated or whatever than it was but it was more like just me in a moment being like oh my god this is crazy i don't like these things i need to say how i feel so that's it was that simple um and but you know even even like the 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 first sentence that andrew so kindly read for us in, in the quote was i haven't done demos in a while and this is like a big part of why is um i do feel more and more like people are becoming a little skeptical and jaded about these videos and i don't think it's it's deserved um because i the vast vast majority of people making these videos are like the, there is no corporate um scheming going on in the background you know like walrus is doing like a very simple and 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 smart thing by just gathering up people to make videos it makes sense and all of the people that are making them aren't they're not being told what to say um and they're just individuals who are like stoked to have early access to a pedal and play it um mm -hmm. so, so it is it is innocent but the more it happens the less innocent it appears on the surface um and that's that's the risk and that's why i feel like it's unsustainable um in the long run yeah and i i do feel like um it, it's it's always for me hard to distinguish between the people who are commenting on a post to just want to agree with you to agree with you and and not not specifically you or this but just kind of in general and other people who like actually agree with you because they they agree with the sentiment and i mean i do agree with the sentiment i think that 40 is a lot of demos and i i don't really have a big place to, to talk about this i was not invited to do the juliana demo and anything negative i say people will construe as me being a little bitter about not being part of it and full disclosure like i was i was bummed i was bummed that there were they picked 40 demo artists and literally none of them were were women um that was more disappointing to me than um than that i wasn't a part of it at all i, I wish they would have found uh somebody if not me to to you know represent women and i feel like walrus has like done ads and she shreds and stuff and they have a couple female artists like julian baker who likes their stuff so that was one of the, the issues i i had with the launch was that you know there was some diversity in there and i do applaud that i applaud that they didn't just get a bunch of english language channels or a bunch of american-based channels or even uh north american channels um they did seem to branch out quite a bit um, Andrew, I'm going to close this chat. So if there's anything good happening, please let me know. For sure. I know what you're talking about. Okay. All right. Also, I know that person that they just mentioned, and I would be really surprised to hear that. So I'm going to have to close all my YouTubes. We'll just um, edit this part out. Yeah. Oh my God. Where are these? I've closed. Sorry. I keep getting notifications and I would like to turn off all notifications for Chrome. Great. Fantastic. Uh, sorry, it's hard to talk when you just keep getting bings in your ears. Um, so like, I really do applaud them for, you know, having some diversity, but I also kind of wonder as a marketing person, what even is the effectiveness of such a large coordinated drop versus spacing out your assets? I don't think it's good. I don't, I don't know if it's good. I think that it is really much like a shotgun blast, like in into the air and kind of seeing, seeing what it hits. But um, I mean, everybody who plays pedals, I think knows that Walrus came out with the Juliana and uh, that's good, but I think it's also important to gauge like, what is the reaction to that? Like, yeah. are people getting kind of tired of it? Cause I saw more than one comment in more than one, place like not even just your instagram posts but some other videos that it just kind of felt felt weird and kind of gross and too too coordinated i guess i don't know i think people like authentic authenticity and then when they realize that this is actually a business that exists for the sole purpose truly the sole purpose of making money like most businesses um i shouldn't say that about walrus i don't know they have other reasons to make things i'm sure 
uh, to make things that sound good, but it's a business and exists to make money. And mm -hmm. is that the smartest decision to do just a coordinated dump of all your assets at once? Totally. Yeah. One thing I find really interesting for whatever reason is like, um, I'm really into synthesis and modular synthesis. And it seems like there's very little, like people that are into guitar stuff or pedals or whatever tend to just stick to that and not explore synths or whatever it's generalizing, but, um, this this kind of whole thing has already played out um in the synth community there was a whole bunch of backlash to arturia and some of their their launches um and i think that those those launches were smaller than the one that walrus just did in terms of like coordinated video drops um so that's definitely like kind of informing my opinion is you know as someone who who makes videos i'm i care about this more than people normally would um and I was already kind of skeptical about what would happen when these launches just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then, and then I saw it happen. So that was kind of, uh, in my mind is, is that I, you know, there, I, I think there's a capacity. I think there has to be. And, and I also, like I, like I was saying earlier, I think that, um, it's just not the way it appears. And I think that's a shame is, is that people making these videos aren't, you know, there's no like a conference call with Walrus Audio and all the video makers. It doesn't happen. Like the communication is so sparse and simple and, and, and just honest. But then when the end result is lumped into this coordinated video drop, it just, it, it appears so much more sinister and corporate than it should. And it's just a shame. And, uh, and to your point earlier, I don't really think it, it helps. I think it would be better to space them out anyway. So it's kind of like everybody's losing with this approach. Yeah, I mean, I there were channels big a lot bigger than mine that got fewer views on uh, the the exciting new launch of an exciting new project product by a very well known company. There are videos that of channels that were bigger than mine that got fewer views at least last time I looked than my demo of a Dogman Devices pedal that you know I did kind of as a favor to Lance like. Like he's not a big company and yet, and I'm not a big channel. And just because it wasn't part of a deluge, I think, I think that's why people watched it almost like, mm -hmm. I think it was a favor to me to not be a part of that. And I say that in the day that this launches, I'm scheduled to be part of the launch. And I don't know how many other pedals are going to be a part. Of, I don't know how many other demos are going to be a part of it. Um, but it's a really cool pedal and I was just excited to have it. And there was nothing weird or nefarious about that about doing the launch the way I'm doing it. They're just like, they want to release the pedal at a certain date and time. And um, they're the, it's their rules and they That's want it all thing, to go right? at the same time. Yeah, yeah, it's a thing. Sure. So I'd like to step in and clarify a couple of things real quick. Uh, so hearing you talk about this, it, the, cons the overwhelming concern from you seems to be about the optics of a launch like this and kind of from a marketing perspective, both out of, concern for the company that's releasing the product as well as for the optics for all of those involved and how that makes their channel look because the way you, you seem to have framed this is this makes all of the channels involved uh, complicit in some sort of a corporate sinister scheme is the way that it comes off for a lot of folks uh, but the the way that it came off in the the original quote the way you framed it, um, it led to some criticism i've seen a couple forums that kind of sits along the realm of like oh he didn't know that he was like this is a, this is a marketing gig he didn't know that um kind of like this is par for the course sort of criticism and it seems really strange for you to be the the criticism was that you it seemed like you were trying to claim some sort of artistic integrity is sort of the way it came off and that's not what i'm hearing out of you though and i just want to clarify that that that, that i'm hearing that correct yeah I think it's a it's a fine kind of rebuttal, but um, I think I think it's because they presume that we we are aware is the thing, and for me it's more like okay I got an email from Walrus Audio, um, I've I've been so I've been not doing demos at all um, because it's I can only speak for myself right now, but I haven't been doing demos at all because I kind of just got worn out. Um, and then I got this email and was like, okay, this, I can make an exception here because the Julia, I think the Julia is the most watched demo I've ever made. So just felt wow. a little, um, sentimental. 
so you know the whole thought process is a very like sure i know I, they, they're paying me like i know i'm helping them to to sell a thing like I'm, there's no naivety there but when i'm making the decision about whether to take it or not it's it's like it's pretty personal and there's other things i could do and and so um and i was aware that there would be some kind of coordinated launch but then when it hits a certain point i feel like you know if everyone knows that walrus is out to sell their pedals and and so the like the backlash from something like this is is pretty small to them like everyone knows what their intentions are but i think that um people that are making these videos do them for a variety of reasons and i think that the credibility goes a lot further like maybe people don't think that i'm objective <laughs> maybe that's like already out the window um but i am and i it's so it's important to me to like maintain that and to make that clear is like i'm not doing things because people tell me to i'm doing them because i want to um it is a job but i can i i'm still able to do it in a way that i feel good about um mm -hmm. and that's important and and something like this it just makes me feel like oh i was complicit in something i didn't want to be and and i wasn't aware of it in advance yeah no that that makes sense um a lot of people have uh you know i feel like i've seen some criticism that just like you said people say that or andrew said that you took money for this and then they feel like you're then bad talking the company and i think that from what you said at walrus probably feels that way a little bit and it sounds like that wasn't really your intention but i mean how, how do you how do you how do you rec how do you rectify that yeah the, i think that's kind of to, to just be very simple about it. like that's why i would have said things differently is um you know i think walrus were like justifiably upset about it and there's there's more mm -hmm. i could have done to just figure out the scale of things and and also they didn't know the scale i think it's important is is um you know after all this there have been conversations with them and they you know, they didn't send out all of those pedals with the intent of having them demoed. There was a, there was some kind of like event that happened. Someone oh, at the, the event 40, the pedal. 42 gear street. Yeah. Somebody had that pedal and then they all did demos. That was probably at least 10 of them. Yeah. So there were, there were things outside of their control. And, um, and, and I will say that like, they've been, Walrus has been very receptive to my thoughts. Not, not you know, they're not totally agreeing with me. I think that they they like their approach, and uh, we just like respectfully disagreed. But I mean, I get it. I guess that's yeah. a point. Like, I, I can see why someone would see me speaking out and being like, "Nobs is trying to have it both ways and like make money and and be an artist." And um, mm -hmm. well, you it, can't make money and be an artist. <laughs> that's just this this. You got to do it for the love of the art or you do it for the money. That's what everybody says, right? Yeah. Yeah. I just think I that guess a lot of stuff like this is more simple than it appears. You know, it just really is like it's People um... love to imagine nefarious things. I think that's why <laughs> conspiracy theories are so big. But like yeah. I I also do kind of want to know like what 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 people think is happening that's nefarious. Like I mean, the scale of the nefariousness would be that like everyone's getting together and and you know marketing like a traditional company would um you know like that's the the peak nefariousness <laughs> it's not like legitimately unethical sure. or anything it's not like we're all gonna we know this this pedal is a lemon but we're all going to act like it's friggin fantastic like yeah. i there there are pedals i've played that just didn't jive with me and i just kind of presented them in as the in the demo as was i let people see it like occasionally malfunctioning and honestly the the guy who built that pe pedal where i showed it malfunctioning um he was actually thankful that i did that and it still gets a lot of views and he's made a bunch of improvements and i think i'm going to get the improved one soon but like i yeah i don't know what people think is happening i think that people i think there's got to be a lot of positive there's a lot of positivity in these demos partially because i think that if if you don't like a pedal, maybe it just isn't right for you. Maybe it's not a bad pedal. And I don't want to say that something's a bad product if I, if I know that it would fit with somebody's, you know, sonic goals. Like like you were talking about feedback loops and, and self-oscillating and kind of bad, scary noises that, you know, that's right in a lot of people's wheelhouses. And I don't want to, I don't want to talk bad about something just because it's not for me. It's like, I don't want to wear palazzo pants, but if somebody wants to wear palazzo pants, I'm not going to like judge them for it. What's a palazzo well, sure. pant? 
um i think it's just like it's like um big flowy like i think they might have been called elephant bell bottoms at some point or like just like the really big flowy it's i don't know i don't know how to describe them i mean yeah. maybe a, a more uh, relevant you know comparison would be like if someone wants to have pineapple on their pizza i'm not going to judge them for it no oh. <laughs> i love Just that kidding. example i don't know why that's a subject of discussion who gives a heck about pizza put anything because on your pizza <laughs> internet beef tastes good uh <sighs> look i as far as like the coordinated dump like for like that nefarious marketing thing i don't think people like feeling like they've been lied to people don't like feeling like they've been played people and don't I, like I, feel like they're being marketed to they, sure. they don't and that's that's a pretty normal thing and i don't think there's anything wrong with that sentiment uh sure there's a little bit of naivety on the part of the consumer to think that they're not being marketed to day in and day out uh by so many different companies and there's a reason why data is on like personal data is worth so much money but i i, I definitely get why people would be upset by that i think it's interesting that you mentioned that there was a vent uh you guys said with 42 gear street who's passing it around yeah that was uh, the hitting poly Event. Isn't that well? Because mo for most launches, a company is going to make you sign an NDA, mm, and so no. isn't that <laughs> within Walrus's control to say, "Hey, we had an NDA to only send it to one of you guys. Why did ten of you get to see it before?" Are NDAs aren't that common. It? Yeah, we've signed one, Andrew. Okay, well, and that was with Stratton, fair enough. Yeah, and most usually it just says, "Hush, hush." sure but and if they don't like what you did if you just think they don't like you're not going to get the next one i think there's i think it's fair to say that there's at least an implied nda uh, is that am i wrong there i feel like that seems like it, in good faith we gave you this pedal keep it on the down low sort of a thing i mean it's a good question i like a lot of the questions you're asking um i think so the, you know the pressure the 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 only like real deal that's made for me you know i'm not going to events with my pedal but it's just like don't share this before this date please yeah not publicly don't be a jerk. like right like you're gonna you can you can show your friends you can show your family shoot you can record with it as long as you don't say what it is and post pictures of it yeah don't spill the beans right yeah. i just <sighs> The reason why I'm asking that is you mentioned that it was outside of Walrus's control, and the, I wanted to clarify whether or not that, like, because if there was an NDA, maybe that is more in Walrus's control to come back and sit, say to 42 Gear Street, you guys screwed up. We're not okay with that. You, well, what are they're... they going to do about it, honestly? Just not ever send those big demo artists their pedal ever again? Maybe. Uh I, there's it, there's definitely a level of they need the demo artist to market their equipment and that's why they're paying for it and uh so to, well, there's yeah. there is a there's a power if, dynamic if, there i think again I'll just say, were... go on go ahead no you go ahead i was just gonna say again it's a case of it just being so much simpler than you'd think like you yeah. know they sent it to henning Polly because they do um they probably send them everything they make and then now that this has happened, is it is it really worth like going and reprimanding him? Like, not really. You know, it's kind of just like, okay, well, that happened. Um, yeah. You know, maybe you please not do it next time. <laughs> yeah, and maybe they'll like. I am I am advocating for like uh, change. Definitely, I think what I'm not trying to say is that anyone is necessarily like innocent or a villain. Like, I think that I I definitely I'm gonna make some adjustments because I think I made some mistakes in this campaign. Um, and it seems like Walrus is considering doing the same. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm going to be asking more questions about how things are going to be released going forward. I've never felt the need to do that as a thing. I've made over 100 demos, and this is the first time where I was truly taken off guard. Um, but now I will. And I'm also going to start writing reviews because I think that this, um, you know, just showing what the sounds are is, you know, creating the impression of being like a, the marketing arm of a company so these are like some steps i'm taking and will continue to take to feel good um and i think you know walrus will probably do the same and and yeah it's it's just simple right. you know they made an honest mistake with or not even a mistake but like they just didn't realize that that would happen with the gear street thing and then it did and it's not a huge deal none of it is i mean they got they got free videos out of it but 
As I, I doubt those guys went back later and be like, hey, now you gotta pay me my rate. No. <laughs> sure. Absolutely not. Yeah, I mean, they were just, they are getting in early to try and uh, get a share of the views on launch day to help promote their channel. Yeah, or, or that, I, don't think that, I don't think that do. worked. <clears throat> I don't think it worked. Well, it, yeah. Well, like the numbers, the numbers, I don't know how it compares to your normal view view count scott but someone else told me that it was only in it, it ranked seven out of ten in their ten most recent releases like it was just yeah definitely lower than normal for sure yeah I and think there's... i think i think the deluge was a big part of that and then it kind of begs the question well are they still getting the numbers they wanted to get overall and i think a lot of people were i i don't think it was a small number of people who got um kind of Felt like it was too much like a, an, an absolute flood of demos and i think especially post fire festival i think people are kind of more aware of what those coordinated campaigns look like hmm. and like, like you said they're not they're not nefarious it's just like hey everybody let's get together and do this at the same time i mean i used to do uh, marketing for concerts and live events and festivals and that's that's exactly what we wanted to happen on launch day we wanted when we released our lineup, we wanted everybody to post about it at roughly the same time. We want to flood, uh, you know, Instagram feeds and we just want to get the word out because that's one of the best times to sell tickets is like when you release the lineup. So like that is, it's a marketing technique. It's sure. Sure. But sure. I mean, you also have to gauge the response that people have to it. I mean, I could talk about the walrus release in particular and say like, I think they messed up not having any women demo the pedal. I think that is kind of weird that they had just released the V2 of the Julia back in January, and now they're essentially releasing what is kind of like a V3. Like, if I had bought the V2, I'd be uh, annoyed that I could have just waited and gotten something with, with more features. You know what I mean? And honestly, the trailer that they did that kind of played on the missing woman trope I thought that was um, that made me sick to my stomach. I didn't like it at all. I thought it was a bad decision. Hmm. Sure, I mean, I, I think there's, uh, I think those are all fair criticisms of this particular launch. But looking at, I don't even think I don't even think the flood of the forty demos was the worst part of it. I mean, so uh, speaking about the flood specifically, so the reason why I'm trying to 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 home in on that a little bit here is. The point of with 42 Gear Street adds a little bit more of complexity and it kind of opens up the window into the that wasn't this nefarious launch. Uh, I think it opens up the window into it's not Walrus Audio's fault necessarily. It sounds like it was intended to be a lot less of that. And the the reason why I'm trying to home in on that is the the caption that was put in that Instagram post seem to really directly target Walrus. And you've said a couple of times now that they're justifiably upset as a result. And I, if knowing a little bit more about how the situation happened behind the scenes, it sounds like maybe they were also just as blindsided by this. And maybe this wasn't part of their calculation for re reaching that critical mass of diminishing returns uh, from a marketing value on the launch. I'd, and, I'd say so to an extent. Yeah. And so with all of that in mind is would you maybe want to be interested in making some sort of a, let's say Colt is listening to this podcast. I, would, is there anything you want to say to, to him after this? Oh, I mean, I've already spoken with Colt. Like, uh, I don't know if a, a public apology is necessary, but, um, yeah i don't think you need to feel like you need to say anything i'm not saying yeah. you need to, i'm just i'm opening the floor for whatever you want to say on that well matter. i think kind of like how we said earlier like you you said you like you did say that you would say it differently yeah and i think that you kind of explained how the different way you would say it totally and i think you've also already mentioned like what what you learned and all that so like you don't don't feel like you have to honestly the, Sorry, only, the only thing i'm gonna say and it only occurred to me like five minutes ago is there's there's a slim chance that doing this podcast has made things worse. <laughs> like, I'm not trying to make it a big story. And it, it wasn't, it was never, it was never my intention to cook up some beef. I was speaking from a very personal place. Um, so yeah, I hope it doesn't make things worse. I think, I think that Walrus were, were upset in a justifiable way and receptive. And uh, yeah, and, and I, I would soften the way I said things if I could. 
Yeah, and I think that they handled that um, publicly well enough. Um, I don't think there was... I, I don't think they could have handled it better publicly than they did. Um, their response was, you know, I think measured is probably a good way to say that. And it wasn't our intention to have you on and only talk about that. It just kind of turned into that. So Yeah, I mean, I don't um, mind. It's just, you know, I'm really yeah. not trying to put Walrus through the ringer. That's like, that's the point. Is no, and, This is more about I, me. <laughs> right. And that I, that's part of what I was trying to, to build into is I, I really don't think it's fair to put them through the ringer um, for that for that specific part of it either. And I, I think it's really cool to hear you say that and to hear that there's a level of um, reflecting and adjusting and moving forward in a positive and healthy manner, I think is, I think is more of what this industry needs. Mm -hmm. And I think that like Andrew had mentioned earlier that there, there is a video going around where somebody, these, these two folks, um, they say that, uh, they, they liken paid demos to payola and they said something like somebody's getting ten thousand charging ten thousand dollars for pedal demos, which um doesn't sound right at all. Like I don't know I don't think that there are really any you laugh. <laughs> just an I, audible I, laughter. Yeah, I just love to know. If, like, great. Ain't nobody ain't, ain't nobody getting that from pedal demos because uh like I don't think there are very many pedal manufacturers who would pay who have that kind of budget for a single video i mean if you go into like a commercial warehouse and uh film a demo with a big major agency yes they're going to charge you ten thousand dollars at least two thousand dollars for the videography work alone without a supplied audience and that's just how much like videography theatrical videography can cost but to, to say that someone like i know that you don't charge ten thousand dollars for demos and and you're one of the biggest channels. Yeah. I mean it's it's interesting. Yeah. Like all things are possible, but uh <laughs> it's a, it's a it's a reach. It's a pretty big reach. And yeah, I mean if if someone charged ten thousand dollars for a demo, <laughs> there's like maybe five companies that could afford it. And of that five, like would they? Probably probably not. I don't know. I mean that's a reflection on the companies too. Like I don't know that that many companies are like sure let's spend ten thousand dollars on this one video i think that someone like uh strymon when they did or fender when they do in-house videography i think that when everything is said and done when they bring in the artists like vanessa wheeler uh when they shoot the videos um i think that all of that combined could come to ten thousand dollars but that's what you're paying for a marketing asset you're not paying a demo artist ten thousand dollars to review or just play your pedal for you know 10 minutes in front of like their audience of you know a couple hundred thousand like that's just not that math doesn't add up and also the idea of comparing it to payola is weird and i think that most demo people i think that they're being honest when when they review gear or they're just at least trying to be measured because what good does it do to just on a a pedal like what what good does it do I don't think it does any. Yeah. And reviewing creative tools is, is really sketchy territory. I think it can be done. Like I think sound on sound are extremely good at it. Um, but it's a, yeah, it's an odd thing to do because one person's garbage is another's gold. And uh, aside from like obvious things like, oh, the knob does nothing the first half of the sweep and then things happen, which is almost never the case. Like what do you, yeah. what can you really objectively review in, in a, in a pedal that's why i always like doing yeah. demos it's like here's the sounds you can achieve yeah do the it boost if you want doesn't the boost doesn't isn't boosty enough um I, i'll i'll i mean i'll talk about um my biggest thing with pedals is is personally like if i don't feel like they go far enough like if i if i'm like i don't know why they didn't go all the way out with the rate on this tremolo or or something like that like i just feel like you should be able to do more than you need to do Mm -hmm. versus wanting more and that's really my most common negative criticism of any pedal i've ever demoed yeah i feel like the things that matter with any pedal are so subjective that i mean i, I kind of made this choice on purpose like i really feel like a pedal review will mislead you more than it will help you for the most part because the stuff that matters like the stuff that makes it a part of your music and your workflow is so so personal 
and there's no way you're going to know until you use it like it could sound great it could do exactly what you want and there's something about the way it works that'll just be a deal breaker for you like that's i mean that's how musical things work so mm -hmm. it's um you know saying something is good or bad is is a bit silly yeah unless it's unless it doesn't work that's really exactly. the only yeah. unless it doesn't work if like you can't if the input jacks like if you can't actually get anything in there very easily <laughs> or if, the input jacks are the wrong size yeah yeah or the toggle like I have one guitar where the toggle keeps like bouncing back into the middle. Actually, I think I got rid of that guitar. <laughs> there you go. But like things like that, like that you don't yet, yeah, you probably aren't even going to know by the time uh, you film a demo. Like, unless and if it's you not really like them, you're not going to care. Like, you yeah. surely both of you have things that are like kind of broken and you barely even notice because they're so useful for you in other ways. Like, I don't know. As someone who like as as much as I make this stuff, I also consume it and I like buy musical instruments and I really rely on reviews and demos because you just you need some some input. Um, you know, I'm just really aware of how like I'll read a review and be like, ah, yeah, that's not for me, and then I'll catch myself and be like, wait, none of those things apply to the way I make music. Like, I don't record a string quartet ever. <laughs> like, I'm shopping yeah. for mics right now. It's like, why do I give it if this sounds bad for a string quartet? I don't. And I think yeah. that more than we realize, reviews kind of have this effect on us. We just trust this like floating text. Like we don't even know the person who wrote it and are just like, okay, yeah, this, this mic isn't the best. Yeah. No, that's such a, like people saying that you need to have like very, really expensive mics to record your guitars. Then you watch Gillian Welsh and Dave Rawlings at the Academy Awards and they're just playing into SM57s. And you're like, well, maybe you don't need the $5,000 microphone. Maybe the maybe the $88 on the used marketplace microphone. If it's good, like if it's good enough for them, then maybe it's good enough for you. Like I always say, you don't need this expensive gear. Like you don't need the Chase Bliss Automaton, but it's really, really cool. Like, and if it works with your workflow and if it's something that you feel like would help you reach whatever goal you're trying to achieve sonically, or in live situations, then yes, it's a it's a great pedal for you. And if you don't need those things, and it's not a good pedal for you, I also think it's just a big part of like human culture, in mm -hmm. a lot of ways to kind of be negative about something if it's not for you, or try to make it about you if it's not for you. And I think that that's a big that's a big problem we face uh, every day in the in the world and in the gear community. It's totally. not it's not it's not great in the gear like oh you need this I'm like well maybe maybe not well sure I, I think a really great example of of that might be like metals uh metal zone demos because mm -hmm. like <laughs> i remember the the waza came out and i watched pete thorne's demo on i'm like oh shoot this sounds way better than i remember it sounding and then i went and go play it in the store i'm like oh yep no it's a metal zone i just don't it doesn't work for me it doesn't do what i want it to do it doesn't integrate in a rig that the way that i want it to and that's fine it's still a great pedal it just doesn't do it for me personally totally but and maybe it doesn't do it for pete personally either but it, that doesn't mean he's being dishonest in the way that he's presenting it either i think that's a completely fair thing to say and i do think people know this like i think every musician once you've gone through a few waves of like gear acquisition and trading and whatever like Everybody implicitly knows this is true, but I think it's it's you easy, easily forget. You forget that when you look at your own collection of stuff, it's made up of things that like other people would hate or are half broken or like barely make sense for you, but they just stuck for some reason. Like everyone's collection of musical stuff is like that. Um, but we just forget. And I think a lot of the conversation that happens online, which is really what we're talking about, um, ignores that or like couldn't possibly address that. So you get swept up in the other part of it, which is, you know, the the good and the bad and nine out of ten, which is nonsense. You mean to tell me that the internet thrives on the ignorance of nuance? No. The internet. <laughs> the internet's so good at nuance. That's why there are those weird tags on Reddit, like forward slash S for sarcasm. Do? It, it implies oh, sarcasm. Okay. Every time I'm like reading the guitar pedals jerks on Reddit, I'm like, every, there's like forward slash UJ. And I'm like, I don't know what that means. Like, do people know what this means? 
It doesn't stand. And then I looked at him like, it doesn't really stand for anything that makes sense. Like, why are you doing this? That, that oh place can be, can be really brilliant sometimes. Yeah, it can. It can also be really scary. They yeah. hated the they hated the flood of <laughs> Juliana demos on on guitar pedal jerks. Mm-hmm. I think that they they're like kind of in that that realm of um, it's so popular and they see it so much they just kind of get sick of it. And I think that's another kind of part of we were talking earlier about people not liking bands once they become famous. I think the th- same thing ultimately happens with gear that was once boutique. It was like, oh, that's something I haven't seen before, too. Like, why does every board in the world have the same pedals? And uh, I just think that people get kind of like nothing is that good and get kind of uh, burnt out on it yeah. and probably are just grumpy and have some of their own things to work work on i mean i think that's what it comes down to right yeah these are also the people that are making fun of billy eilish's new signature ukulele and complaining about it yeah and i think like not to demonize whoever whoever mysterious people we're talking about i think we all do this like whether you get on the internet and type about it is something different um but we all have these thoughts like yeah i tend to go after things that not everybody's using um Mm -hmm. so you know, whatever it's like mumford and sons it's only cool until everyone else finds out about it yeah i know it's like it's like i love bookworm devices and if they got big i hope i would still like them i hope they get big i think that they deserve to be bigger than they are i think brian over there makes some really interesting stuff i don't think he listens to this podcast that's fine i've never heard of <laughs> bookworm devices Book, oh, sorry, if I say device, Bookworm Effects. They're based out of West Virginia. Mm-hmm. Um, but they make some really cool stuff. And I like their, my favorite pedal of theirs, I think, is the Delayed Foster Wallace, which can work like a normal delay that has an infinite hold switch. But it also has a toggle, so you can have the, the amount of light in the room controls the, the, the speed of the delay, the time. Mm. So you can do cool stuff like, wave your hand over it and it will just get this really slow low fl- lo-fi clunky like k- 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 kind of sound with the delay you can use it with strobes if you are comfortable around strobes which a lot of people aren't um <laughs> shining a flashlight at it and stuff like that so it just it ends up being like a really cool kind of uh environmentally influenced pedal which i think is really neat nice Yes. I loaned that one to my singer and that's I think one of her favorites right now. Which is cool. It's cool. Mm-hmm. It's cool for someone to, to for some to see people develop a love of something that you are really interested in when they've never really had it before, understood it before. Um so that's been really that's been really cool, a cool experience. And I think more people are having that experience. And I think it's more important now than ever that there are people who are, you know, showcasing how they're using different pedals and effects um, on the internet because we're not really at a time when we can go into a store and, like, try out five different delay pedals because even the stores that are open are putting restrictions on, like, what you're able to touch. Depends Mm -hmm. on where you're at. (laughs) Some people don't care. (laughs) Everybody Um, should. So question I have for you. So you talked a little bit ever so briefly about the fallout from Arturia over in the modular synth world. And I'm, I, I'm curious because it seems like a pretty direct uh, analogous situation to what we've got right now. How did that resolve? Did it resolve? Did it get ugly? Was it, a, how, how did that play out? And how do you think is, how likely do you think it is that the gear industry on the guitar pedal side of things is going to play out the same way? Well, Aturia adjusted since that release. Um, I think they felt that like the, the backlash wasn't worth the potential uh, good press or whatever from doing a big video launch like that. So they've really chilled out their launches. Um, And I think personally, I'm not like a, it's kind of strange. We're talking about this. Like I already kind of feel like it's like embarrassingly too much, but um, like, I I don't like uh, provocative things and this is all like a bit out of my comfort zone. Um, I think the reason that I, I did feel comfortable saying anything at all is I think it's an inevitability. That's that's my take on it. I think whether I said that or not, people were going to be put off by it. And I think whether people were put off by this release or not, it was going to happen. Um, 
it's and it, people were put off by it you're yeah. totally right and i think and and i do i do kind of in, in my own um view on this or like rationale i do put the people making these videos at the center of it because i think they're it's going to be them that like feels the first wave of like hurt uh, from it like whatever product arteria released still sold like crazy i'm sure um but what's going to happen is people making these videos are just going to be like unwilling to be a part of it after a certain point because because their audiences were like getting mad at them and that's kind of more what happened with the arteria thing is i think i think the um the the attacks towards the the video makers and youtubers was like more direct and they all kind of felt like whoa um so i i, I do feel like it's unsustainable i think there's just like a a point where people will not be into it anymore and and adjustment will be necessary yeah yeah but um at the same time i i know ryan burke has pointed this out like do we think it would have been better for walrus to do 10 videos a day for a couple days or do 10 videos wait a couple weeks and do 10 and wait a couple weeks and do 10 i mean i think i think so i think it would have spread out like i think it would have lengthened the time that's would it have better. meant that those those pedal built those demo artists down the line um got fewer views well no i don't actually think they would have gotten fewer views because i don't think a lot of people were getting a ton of views on launch day for it maybe maybe siphoning out them out a little bit better would have uh actually helped those channels as well i mean it's always helpful like i, I and at the same time i know that if i'm the first one of the first people who gets a demo out I'm I'm going to do better, but I'm a smaller channel, so it That's probably works a little different. The, we did that for the blooper release, actually. So I feel yeah. Like I mean, I I did yeah. get to demo the blooper. It was great. It did really well for me. And we weeks I think, later. I, I I presume we kind of get yeah, like we just kind of told everyone straight up, like we we did we don't think these are very good. Uh, it's a very good strategy, um, and you know we're kind of hoping you can release between these dates and left it at that. And I don't think anyone was upset about that approach. Um, like to me, there were no negatives at all to doing it that way. Mm-hmm. So I think we chose yeah. like less than 10 people for like launch day release. And, you know, may- maybe some feelings were hurt. Like I'm sure everybody wants to be part of the launch day release, but I think most video makers do realize like this is also in my best interest and feel a similar way about it. Mm-hmm. Totally. I mean, it also meant that I wasn't under such a, I mean, I wasn't part of the initial launch. I did it much later, but I got to spend more time with the pedal, which I feel like made my demo stronger Mm because I had a better understanding of, of what it could do. And that's especially important in more, in more complex pedals, um, to not, to not rush that. Totally. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, Like, (sighs) I don't know. I, I get why like siphoning it out a few uh, few at a time makes sense from a marketing perspective. It makes perfect sense. But part of me wants to just shake every single person that watches these things that, and say, "Look, this is America. <laughs> we like things like all at once and instant gratification. Just having a treasure trove of quality videos on something just immediately." And it just part of me wonders like why. Like I get it, but there's also the part of me that's like, I don't know. Like, part of me would rather just kind of have them all and just have a chance to sit down and binge watch five hours of of demos maybe i i'm just a fanatic and there's something i should see a therapist about that but i don't know it i just think it's <laughs> it's funny that this is where it ends up playing out but i mean 10 uh, videos is already a lot of videos right like are you telling me you'd watch more than 10 in a sitting you can it's fine but it's a lot it's already a lot and it wouldn't be the first time i've done it but i don't make a (laughs) habit of it (laughs) so i mean personally i also know that there's like there's this real which is also stupid but there's this real like human phenomena where you know you want to you'd rather watch something when it's new than when it's old so like i i personally if i'm considering buying something 10 videos on release day great i'll gobble them up and then you know if there's like a video a day going forward i'm far more likely to take an interest in those than to go back to the other 30 i didn't watch on launch day because those already kind of feel like old news you know there's like some part of the human brain that would rather watch the new thing mm-hmm. sure i think i think also part of it might be and i i'm gonna go out on a total limb here but a lot of people just don't have money laying around where they can just buy stuff as it's released just for the hell of it uh 
and so right part, now. Sure. I, but part of me wonders if there's not like this voyeuristic sort of unspoken want out of watching these demo videos is to want to feel like you're a part of something special. Like when you're watching only the 10 and when you go, when you see that there's 40 of them, suddenly it kind of takes that, takes that away from you. And if some, if you're for someone who wasn't even going to buy it in the first place, but just wanting to, to kind of live that moment of like, Oh, this I'm, I'm experiencing part of something that's really cool and unique and exclusive and boutique and all of these other buzzwords that we, we like to associate and add value, or add perceived value to a product. I think even for the people that aren't buying it, because let's be honest, not everyone went out and bought a Juliana that day. Uh, and a lot of the people who were uh, talking about the Juliana were, aren't realistically ever going to buy one. So I could be completely off base At there. The but At the same time, one of the most important things about marketing and one of the most um... – one one thing that's very important is is the repetition because so you have a you have a you have a sales funnel at the top of the sales funnel is is awareness and then you move down to like consideration and to the purchasing so that's one of the reasons that if you've ever bought ads with podcasts or radio they recommend repetition because it takes people hearing about it more than once more than twice more than three times the more they hear about it the more likely they are ultimately to buy it it's the same reason retargeting ads, though annoying, work. And why abandoned cart emails, though annoying, work. I mean, in these marketing techniques, they, they work. And I just, and part of me, and like, honestly, Scott, if, if I were you and I had been a part of a, a launch and I had this big channel, I know I can get like 15,000, 20,000 views in a day. If, if, I, if someone paid me money to do that and then they in turn did some other actions that made my marketing less effective as a marketer i i get disappointed i get disappointed when clients do things uh that make my marketing less effective whether or not they knew that they were doing it and mm -hmm. that's just that is kind of a um that's that's i mean i've done recording sessions with people and they asked for like a bunch of options on solos and they paid me and then instead of asking me to make revisions on anything or like maybe take this part of that and that part of that, they just cut the solo completely. And I'm like, why didn't you just, you paid me. Why didn't you just ask me to, to do it again or with different effects or something else or try this or try that. Why didn't you do what was, why did you pay me and then just not use what I was doing or use me? You're already paying me for it. So that's, I feel like there's a little bit of a similarity there mm -hmm. and that's just how i would perceive it as as someone who does do marketing yeah i think a fun realization i'm having as we like talk about this is it does just kind of highlight how we're all we're all kind of just figuring this stuff out like we we don't really have these super well thought out plans and that's why we get into situations like this where people are unhappy or don't feel very good and it's like, cause it's, it's pretty relaxed for the most part. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's growing and changing and yeah, there's something nice about that. We're, we're f solving a problem or, or trying to figure out how to manage something. Yeah. And though I'm sure like Walrus has marketing people on a marketing team, it's not nearly as advanced a marketing effort as a lot of things. Like it's still, it's still a relatively small company mm -hmm. and they're doing, and they are doing their best. And um, I hope they take whatever criticisms criticisms they get and they they learn from it. I don't I don't anticipate that they ever ask me to do another demo for after this, but um, <laughs> I mean I, I I get it. And uh, if it's not the fit, then it's not the fit, and that's fine. Um, but I, yeah, I guess I don't really know where I was going with that. They're they're just doing. Everyone's kind of doing their best, and I think that as long as you can like take criticism on the chin and um, at least consider it instead of just writing it off. Um, I think that's important. And that would be, I think the best thing that they could do is whether or not they change how they do things or their approach to things. Um, it, that matters a little bit less than that. They actually took it to heart and considered it. And if they, after careful consideration, they're like, with the way that we're doing things is still working for us, then it's working for them, you know? And sure. there's really not a lot to say about it um, past that. 
Yeah, I mean, so something I said at the beginning of the episode, kind of reflecting back on 100 episodes is, uh, for for me personally, one of my takeaways is this idea of personal growth and listening to, to criticism and other perspectives and really trying to soak that in. I think that's I, – I think that seems like a really good theme to kind of wrap this episode up in a bow in. Um, it, and – Scott, you you said that you don't you're out of your comfort zone and you don't like controversy and kind of putting stirring rocking the boat like that. Um, but I mean, here we are. You, I think it's a provocative you, statements. Sure, you you made some provocative statements, and here we are. And I I don't think that where we're at now is necessarily a bad thing. I think it's really great that we're having this conversation, and I think you're absolutely correct in your assessment that this conversation was going to need to be had at some point. Uh, whether it was you or someone else bringing it up. And I think l- kind of taking in the that theme of taking criticism and constructive feedback uh, on the nose, I think really comes back to me right now, thinking back through everything we've just talked about and really processed out loud. I, I think that's really healthy for, for us. I think it's really healthy for this industry. And I think that's part of what makes this industry feel like a community is if we can continue – to operate on that level. I think we've, I think that's a lot of what I really love about this community. And I think I'm not alone in that. No, I don't think you're alone in that either. It's good. Well said. I don't always like your wrap ups, Andrew, but I liked that one. Aw, was that a, was that Jeff winger enough? Did I get that? Oh, going back to community. Uh, season <laughs> four was the gas leak season. I was wrong. Not season three. Ah, uh, I think so. Yeah, that's to look forward to. I, Did you watch you know, Community, I, Scott? Oh, we should yeah. probably wrap it up, but yeah. Yeah, I'm nice. a fan. Did you have a favorite favorite moment or episode? Ooh. Um, no. <laughs> it's actually been a minute, but that was... I like the, the Timelines episode the best, I think. Oh, yeah, that was a good one. Yeah. Yeah. That, was, that was one of a few shows that have kept me up till the wee hours. Just taking it in. Rick and I have been, my husband and I have been watching Cobra Kai. And he had, and that we watched like the first episode. And he's like, is there something I should have seen to like understand any of this? And I was like, wait, oh what? Has he never husband, seen Karate Kid? He had never seen Karate Kid until no. the other night. Yeah. No. And then we started some of the sequels. I'm like, these are just too dramatic. I love Karate Kid, the first one, because it's just about a kid who has some bullies and wants to get the girl. And it's really simple and relatable. And then it gets, like, the sequels get into weird stuff, like, for some reason these senseis want to kill him. I don't understand it, and also I would prefer not to understand it. <laughs> yeah, can we can we veer off for a second? Because I think it's, yeah. really, it's really fun to start watching things halfway through, like, whether it's, like, starting with season three or whatever. Mm-hmm. It, I think it's actually better a lot of the time to do that. Because it takes so long for for shows, especially, to like get their footing. That I think the first season is often not the best season for shows, anyway. Oh yeah, the first season of The Office is a train wreck. Oh, first first several episodes of Thirty Rock and Parks and Rec are bad, and, or just not what you would want from them. And if you do it that way, it means that every show is going to be at least kind of a mystery. That's a good point. I mean, uh, part of me wants to disagree with you, but I'm also a huge Star Wars fan, and they started on episode four. I think, I think you're onto something. Oh shoot, that's a good point, though. I've never seen. That's a good point. I've never seen Battlestar Galactica, but I've heard that that's how that's how it's uh, advised that you watch that. So I guess there was a movie, and then there was a TV show. I get confused. I get Battlestar Galactica and Battlefield Earth confused. Which one was the Scientology one? Battlefield Earth. Yeah. Okay. That was so bad. So obviously none of us have. Anyway, that's just (laughs) one of those things where like the fans of the show are just like, oh, don't watch that part. Just start here. It'll be better. Yeah. I don't want Rick to watch. I don't want my husband to watch um, two and three uh, for Karate Kid before we finish the, the Cobra Kai. There is stuff in there that's kind of like mysterious. Like they do mention the villains from the third Karate Kid, but uh, I yeah, I, I do think it gets still watchable and understandable when you when you haven't seen Karate Kid. But it helps to have at least seen the first one because it literally starts. The first scene is the end of Karate Kid Part One. 
You get a little something then. Yeah, you get you get a little bit of context, and then thirty four years later, <laughs> it's a it's good. But um, it's 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 one thirty your time. Uh. Well, actually, it's a lot later than that. It's almost 2 o'clock. We've been doing this for a while. I want to be more respectful of your time. Well, we're at what? Uh, we're at 96 minutes now. We're so close to 100 minutes for 100 episodes. Oh, oh we got geez. to do it. That's not <laughs> okay, negotiable. Okay, okay that's, that's fair. Uh, so where can people find you, Scott? Ooh, um, well, I have this YouTube channel called Knobs. Um, is that what you were asking? Yeah, primarily. Yeah. If there's anything else you want to promote, music you've done, or... Oh, plugs. Um... I am this putting work, out right? yeah, plugs. I've been I've been a part of this silly um, improv synth outfit called Playdate, and Ooh. we're we're going to be putting out a record soon. We did um, we live tracked we live multi tracked, which is really an interesting approach. Uh, a bunch of live shows, and um, it's called Playdate Plus One. So it's us as well as another uh, local musician who play more traditional instruments like clarinets or pedal steel. Um, so that's going to come out fairly soon. Um, what else can I tell you? That's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. There's, I mean, there's fun stuff going on. We just did a big blooper update. Um, yep. I haven't released any music as myself um, ever, and I would like to fix wow. that, but I'm uh yeah, the situation hasn't been right in terms of where I live and my mindset. <laughs> um, mm. But I think when you get to that doing... point, make sure to to do that through DistroKid. <laughs> <laughs> and, and use our use our use our affiliate retreat. link on the record. Ooh, yes, tying it together. Don't forget to smash that affiliate link. <laughs> Both of those things. Yeah. It came back around. I love it when that happens. This episode has had a lot of like tying in, come back around kind of stuff people Turn might start around. people might listen to this and accuse us of uh having scripted things and being nefarious yeah. and trying to socially engineer them well that's what happens when you bring on uh, an influencer andrew <laughs> someone left a comment on one of my videos that i should use a script i'm like why do you want that yeah you just can't win no you can't either you're you're too scripted or you're not scripted enough or you talk too much or you don't explain what's happening enough like you can't please everybody so you might as well just do it the way that you like to do it and if and if other people find it and they dig it that's neat and if you if someone offers you criticism that you kind of agree with mm -hmm. then maybe try it out i think that's the best barometer it's uh cool yeah. so then i'm gonna go off script then because we got a little bit uh, nearly a minute before the hundredth minute of the episode. Make it count. You know, it's you know, it's not actually going to say a hundred minutes because we're going to have to put Michelle's song at the end. I know, I know, but but for the talking portion, this is important. So I'm going to I'm going to do something that really unprofessional. But Scott, do you like volume pedals? Um, I've never really gotten the habit of using them. How about Only 90 pedals? seconds? Only Expression 90 seconds. pedals. Seconds. yeah they're they're pretty they're pretty nice have you uh have you ever noticed that they're just kind of boring looking on a board i mean you being someone who just loves <laughs> aesthetic, aesthetic why well, i have Andrew. had that thought did you know that there's a, a really great way that you can fix that in grand style oh tell oh me more God. Oh, Jesus. well i happen to be the owner and proprietor of fox cairo pedal toppers <laughs> i am mortified i didn't see that coming I'm so and we make custom pedal toppers that are uh that are glow in the dark and we can do any color of the rainbow in any design that you want. And we can Why make that aesthetic fit for your board. <laughs> I'm so, you I'm so glad this? you shared that useful information with me, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you doing this? this you so inspired me to go off script and I, I didn't have a written script to, to pitch my product. <laughs> <laughs> do you like funky socks? Well, <laughs> do I have a gift, an exciting new gift idea you for you? Expression pedals are mediocre. <laughs> make them glow in the dark and be radical functional i think uh, functional cut them in rad that's the uh Fox Cairo. hashtag express yourself express yourself i think you could make it go with that off script thing <laughs> all right well we are about we're like five seconds from hitting the uh my name is emily my name is andrew 
Scott. Scott. Goodbye. Bye.